There are six reactors on that site. And they were all built uh, in the 70s. The first one came on in 1971, and by the end of that decade, they, uh, there are six of them. They're all GE designed uh, boiling water reactors, although the last two or three were constructed in Japan rather than by General Electric. And they've been running ever since the, the, the utilities Tokyo Electric Power. The main challenge is that there's a large <coughs> vessel filled with water. The rods are inside it, and the chain reaction heats the water, and the water drives the turbine. If the water disappears from the fuel, it will quickly melt and release a whole lot of radioactivity, which at first stays in this vessel. But pressure will rise, and it will be released from the vessel. Outside it is a very large concrete containment, but um, the containment could be breached too and radioactivity would go outside. And what happened at, uh, at, at these reactors is just that. Units 1, 2, and 3 were running. They were operating at the time of the earthquake and the tsunami. Units 4, 5, and 6 were not running. They not only weren't running, but the fuel was out of the reactors. There was no fuel in any of them. So they were completely safe. There was no problem with that. Their fuel was in the spent fuel pools, which are uh, in the same building as the reactor, and I'll talk about that just briefly. So the earthquake came along. It was the largest earthquake crash you know in the last um, couple thousand years in Japan, although you don't really know how, how big they were uh, going very far back. And when the earthquake uh, struck, all the reactors behaved, the three that were running, behaved just as designed. That is, they shut down, the patrol rods went in, the off-site power was lost. Uh, the reactors are powered uh, not by their own power, but from the grid. And that was lost because of the earthquake. But there's on-site power, uh, diesel generators. And all the diesel generators started just fine. And they provided on-site power. And for the first 40 or so minutes, uh, uh, it was behaving just the way it's supposed to. As best we can tell, there was no damage from the, from the, uh, from the earthquake, although we're not sure yet, uh, later there might be some, but for that first period, there was no damage from the earthquake. They wrote out the earthquake fine. But as you know, a tsunami came about 40 or however many minutes later. And it was between 35 and 40 feet high. An incredibly large tsunami. And it completely swamped the site. In particular, it knocked out the power. It knocked out the on-site diesel generator power. It knocked out both the fuel supply for all those diesel generators and also the electric distribution systems. And so they were in a situation that we call a blackout. That is, they had no, they had no electrical power. The reactors are designed to run without electrical power because they have pumps and systems that will put water back into the, into the vessel. That uh, The pumps run on the steam that the vessel itself is producing because the vessel's hot and producing steam and some of that steam runs these systems. And they all ran fine, except that one after the other, units one, and then two, and then three, those systems fail. And when they fail, quickly the, um, the reactors, all three of them, one after the other, got too hot. The water boiled off. There was no replacement water. The core melted, at least in our estimation, the estimate, estimation of the community that looks at this, somewhere between a third and two-thirds of the cores melted in all three of those reactors. The exact numbers aren't really known yet, and we're not going to know until sometime later when we get inside. So those cores melted, and a lot of that fuel slumped to the bottom. And in order to save the reactors, because they had no water to put in, the reason is that they, they, they had systems to put it in that didn't work. And they had what we call city water coming from you know, someplace off-site. But of course, the earthquake destroyed that. And the only way to get water back into those, those vessels was to bring in, which they did, special pumps, and they pumped it in from the sea filled it with seawater, and that stabilized the situation. And it's been relatively stable ever since. That happened all in the first day or two. And ever since then, it's been relatively stable with seawater, and now, finally, putting fresh water back into those vessels to replace the seawater. But in the course of all of this, the vessel didn't remain completely intact. There are um, valves and seals and flanges that leaked significantly, and the water went out from there, into the containments and went out from the containments into the uh, outside buildings. And also, because the pressure rose, there are uh, safety and relief valves that uh, relieve the pressure. And uh, non condensable gases went out there, the mostly noble gases, which are radioactive. And they brought with them some of the volatile iodine and cesium. And that's what's in the environment. So within uh, certainly the third day, a whole lot of stuff had escaped from those things that the root cause of which was because they were they ran out of power, 
and those uh, steam-driven systems fail too. And, um, and, and the seawater got in too late, so, that, so the cores melted and they're still there. I'll just leave you the one, one of, there's a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave you one other thought. We're not out of the woods yet. And what I mean by that is that there's still some possibility, because they have jury rigged a whole lot of things out there, powder and so on and water. And jury rig systems don't necessarily always work uh, reliably, especially for months, and they have to work for months or maybe even a year or two. And so right now, the Japanese, with the assistance from a lot of other, uh, other places, including us, are, are rigging up backup systems of those jury rig systems, so if they fail, there'll be something right there to pick up the load, the electrical load, and the water load, and so on. One last thing, I'll only take a minute to say. The fourth, <coughs> fifth, and sixth units, the fourth unit in particular, the core wasn't, the, core, the, the nuclear core wasn't in the reactor, it was in the spent fuel pool. And they lost cooling to that, they lost water there, and it also had a very large release. Uh, as best we can tell from that spent fuel pool. Units 5 and 6 didn't, but Unit 4 did. And so the large releases came from the three reactors, and the, the fourth one, it was that fresh core in the spent fuel pool that was, that was its release. And now water is going back in there, and that, that one we hope is going to be stable also. Okay. We're still learning what the releases are. If you've read the news of the last day, you'll probably hear that uh, the Japanese government has raised the a rating of this accident from a five, which was the same as Three Mile Island, to a seven, which is the same as Chernobyl. It's sort of surprising that they went these two full levels. But um, that's, uh, right now they're looking at an equivalent release from the machines total uh, from the, the three damaged reactors plus the spent fuel pool on number four, which is about a tenth of Chernobyl, maybe a bit less, depending on whose book you read there. Well, I'd like to add one thing to Bob's story, which may help a little bit. This is a genuine GE fuel rod right here. This is uh, zirconia. This doesn't have any uranium in it. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, uh, this material gets very hot, and it reacts with water. Uh, if it gets uncovered, it gets white hot, and then there's more water that splashes on it somehow. It releases hydrogen gas. Uh, if all of this material uh, went into a chemical reaction in one of these plants, it makes the equivalent of one fifteenth of a Hindenburg, which is to say about 60 tons of TNT and equivalent explosive energy. So uh, most of this accident was actually within the playbook that got written back in the 1970s called WASH 1400, big government report on, on these reactor accidents. But the one that took everybody by surprise was that uh, when uh, they started having hydrogen gas accumulate in the rooftops of these buildings, uh, and they exploded one by one, then reactor number four, which as Bob said, was mining its own business in sort of a shutdown with the fuel and spent fuel pool, got the roof from number three. Huh. Now, this was not on their plan. All right, and so that, yeah, it was, this was something that was really sort of you stand back and you, you have a certain lesson learned from that process. All right, and that spent fuel pool is essentially the contents of a reactor which had been dormant for a mere three or four months, I think November, they defueled it. And, and so it's still a serious amount of radioactivity without the benefit of containment. Now, additionally, it has the roof of another building on top of it, which means you can't very well fill it with water. This was the scariest part of this whole accident from my perspective, that you had no way to actually get at this fuel. And, and came to the scene the Putzmeister. The Putzmeister is this enormous boom for pouring concrete. And they've managed to very, very carefully be able to inject water in that reactor. That's helped quite a bit. But there certainly were some large releases from that spent fuel pool, and you could see the white smoke billowing out as these fuel rods up there were getting very hot, covered with water, and releasing a lot of material. When the spent fuel is removed from the reactor at first, it's much too hot thermally and much too radioactive, which is hot radioactively, to be stored uh, anywhere but underwater for a few years. Depending on how much radiation it has, it might be two years or three years or five years. But after that, it could be, and nowadays is, stored in what we call dry casks, which are in the air rather than underwater. And those could be anywhere. They could be transported anywhere. 
uh, to a central repository someplace, but at the moment they're basically all on the same site just because that's the political accommodation. But they need not be. Well, some of my colleagues, Kai Vetter and Rick Norman, have been busy uh, doing air monitoring. I think if you visited the Berkeley uh, website, www.nuke.berkeley.edu, you'll see uh, daily reports. And we aren't screening anything. As soon as we have uh, what we consider confident assessment of the data, we've been posting it. You may be interested to know that at one point, March 23rd, uh, the rainwater in Berkeley hit sort of a record of having uh, a level of iodine in it, 131, which was uh, approximately uh, five times higher than that's allowed in drinking water by the EPA. Now that has vanished since, but we can measure all these things. It's still safe enough to the general public. Uh, in fact, we put on there how many liters of this water you have to drink in order to get the equivalent of a round trip plane uh, uh, flight from here to Washington, D.C. And uh, it turns out it would be something on the order of 600 liters in the worst day from that. Uh, I haven't met anyone in Berkeley that drinks rainwater, but uh, if you do, I would, I would avoid March 23rd bottled rainwater. Yeah, it's decayed by now. Um, so uh, uh, we've been busy measuring iodine and, and cesium in various foodstuffs and occasionally found something. It hasn't been real high, but we like putting that data out there because it's my feeling that uh, the way through this uh, uh, as individuals and as a public is total transparency. So we've been trying to, to uh, uh, give you all of the uh, data that we have uh, from that accident. Um, uh, the rough quantity that they're talking now that got released from this accident is, uh, I think I already said this, but it's about 10 megacuries of radioactivity into the air. I suspect that will be revised downwards later, but I've been, uh, I can't really count on it. But it's likely to me that this accident will go down in history ultimately as a 6 and not a 7. And that's my personal opinion, and it's also the opinion of the government of France and various other authorities on the subject. So time will tell. As Bob said, we're early into this accident. We don't know everything. And uh, that's what I have to say. So some people commented and said, hang on a second. You're talking about ingesting water or locally produced milk. I think you also were measuring. Um, and then you're comparing that to taking a plane flight. Mm -hmm. How do those two things match up? Because one is actually entering your body, the other is just you're exposing yourself to radiation. And, and people commented and said, isn't there greater danger in ingestion compared to exposure? Well, you can put together a table of relative risk from doing that. Uh, uh, it's, it, it is a, a little bit of a, uh, of a problem in comparing those things precisely. You know, what does this mean for health? I and mean, let's, let's concentrate at first for people in Japan, maybe the, the 12 mile zone, uh, maybe the sort of broader area in Japan, what do these kind of releases mean in terms of health? And then let's look at what that means across the Pacific. Yeah, well I think it's good to, to start out by you know, talking a little bit about what's in the reactor and, and the significance. Okay. And, and Bob mentioned some of the things that come out. There, uh, in an active core, a mature core that's been operating there's a very large inventory of radioactivity, and there's hundreds of radioactivity. And so it's very interesting. People kind of say, well, why are you only worried about these? Well, the ones that we worry about are, first of all, the ones that are volatile enough to come out. And uh, secondly, we worry about the ones that are in high inventory. And even though there are hundreds of different radionuclides, the abundance are in really a handful. And those are the ones we hear about, iodine. Well, there's the noble gases, but they come out, and they're not particularly a health concern. Uh, iodine, which is liquid, almost a gas at room temperature, if it gets hot at all, and if the fuel on it, you can have iodine <coughs> coming out. It's a large quantity. And these are the radioactive isotopes. The radioactive isotopes. Yeah. Well, it's non-radioactive, or the low, they're all, there are several. Yeah, yeah. The one we're concerned about is iodine-131 because right. of its uh, relatively longer half-life. As the temperature gets warmer, uh, you'll start volatilizing uh, the cesium. Now, cesium has several hundred degree uh, boiling point, uh, but it gets very hot. So it comes out and it condenses immediately into very fine particles. Uh, and so this is what we hear about. People say the particles. Well, they're so small, often you don't see them because they're, they're a volatile metal that's condensing onto particles or just condensing itself into the atmosphere. So that's what comes out. If it gets even hotter, 
they'll start seeing uh, strontium. And we haven't seen that. And I, I don't think the temperature has gotten up to that point. And even hotter than that, then some of the uh, actinides, uh, the plutonium, will start coming out. So that's sort of the stages. In, in a way, this is how the nuclear engineers can, can label that they were seeing things from the reactor because these compounds don't exist sure. in the environment. So let's go through these and talk about what we're uh, concerned about. Iodine, uh, eight day half-life. So roughly the, you know, the rule we have is 10 half-lives is essentially gone. So if it's 80 to 90 days, there won't be any left at all. Okay. Uh, but it's going down by half every, every eight days. Um, <coughs> iodine, when it's taken into your body, it's uh, rather quickly uh, sequestered into the thyroid. Um, and there it's been associated with uh, thyroid tumors, uh, but uh, the, the fatality rate of thyroid tumors is less than 1%. So you, you can get them, but, but this is not really an issue for the Japanese because they got people out and they got them potassium iodide, which for that population is probably the correct thing to do. Uh, the cesium is a, a different problem. Uh, cesium has a 30 year radioactive half-life. It persists in the human body for um, somewhere around 70 to 100 days. So when you take it in, it, it'll uh, distribute in your body. Unlike iodine, uh, cesium is distributed fairly uniformly in, in soft tissue. It accumulates in, in muscle uh, and some of, the, um, some of the other soft tissues. It does not accumulate in the bone. That's strontium. That, of course, we're not seeing strontium. Uh, now, cesium, because it's Fine particles can drift in the atmosphere and also can deposit out. And that's where you know, it gets soluble, relatively soluble, so it washes out of the air with the rain. Uh, the wind patterns move it differently. That's why we're seeing hot spots. You know, if you go to Japan, you don't see a, a uniform concentration of radioactivity in that 18 mile or 20 or 50 mile radius. You'll see hot spots uh, because it goes with the wind, falls out of the atmosphere. Um, a little bit about health concerns. I mean, one of the things that I, I think people don't realize that we have been, not we, not me, but the community has been studying the health effects of radiation since 1895, when x-rays were first discovered. Shortly after that, somebody was holding their hand from front of x-ray beam long enough that their hand turned red. And somebody went, aha, there must be some health effects. Right. And at that time, a program was begun to set safety standards. The first standard was set three years after the discovery of x-rays, and it's been progressing our knowledge of radiation and how it uh, interacts with biological systems. And the types of damage it causes have been studied now for 115 years. Um, it's probably the most uh, advanced and sophisticated of all of the environmental health hazards that we study. For one major reason, we can measure radioactivity these guys in the nuclear engine, can measure it at levels that are unbelievably low. We can count single atoms in a liter of water. But we cannot measure health effects uh, anywhere near those levels. It's impossible. The health scientists cannot really see. We can't see the health effects in the variation of background, which varies between uh, one and six millisieverts. But you know, the, the, over that range, we cannot actually distinguish health effects. So we know the health effects are not associated with, with our measurements. In fact, our measurements are about 12 orders of magnitude sensitivity, uh, but our ability to measure health effects is only about three orders of magnitude range. So below that, uh, we just uh, we can find the new body, but it's not associated with disease. But generally, in public health, you don't want to take an action uh, that can cause more harm than, than benefit. And the uh, the uh, levels of iodine here are so low. And the, the analogy I think you would make is, uh, you know, at, at Oakland Airport, where the jets are really loud, you should wear earmuffs to protect your ears. But, you know, I can hear the jets sometimes when I have very faint sounds, but why would I put on earmuffs to protect my ears from jet engine noise? Right. I mean, so there are precautions you take that make sense, but they're proportional to the, the magnitude of the, of the hazard. And actually, the other side of that is that there are, there are health risks associated with potassium iodide. Um, you know, for older people, there's a higher incidence of allergies. Uh, some people overdose themselves. There have been many reports of people going into poison control centers because they took too much potassium iodide. Uh, if, if someone is pregnant, uh, it's been associated with hypothyroidism in, in 
when the child is born, and that leads to learning disabilities. So, so there's some, some actual risks associated with taking high doses of potassium iodide. So it's something that you know, makes sense if you're at a very high level of relative risk. The reactor core consists of rods. He showed, uh, they're 12 feet long, but he showed a little piece of wood. Of, um, is it called wood? <laughs> filled, with, filled with pellets of uranium. It's uranium ceramic, uranium oxide, that look like little aspirin tablets, a little bigger than that. They fill it in. And, and it's in a big pot of water, and that's what uh, you boil the water and make steam in it makes electricity in the boiling water reactor. When the water goes away, the zirconium will oxidize in the steam that's around. Zirconium plus water makes zirconium oxide and releases hydrogen. And the hydrogen comes off. And that, uh, by the way, there was a big deflagration in Three Mile Island in 1979. It didn't destroy the building, but it was a big bang. And it was uh, because a certain amount of hydrogen accumulated in that building. In the three reactor buildings, there was hydrogen in all three. One and two, no, one and three, actually, it, we had a big, uh, destroyed the building, it's explosion. In number two, uh, a panel broke off the side, you've maybe seen the picture, and there's a hole about this size in it, and the hydrogen did not accumulate. So they were lucky enough not to lose that building. Came from the, came from the oxidation. Okay. Um, you, you said earlier that it's we, we don't know what's to blame at this stage. There's still too much investigation to go on. But you described the design of these reactors. And um, the spent fuel was in this elevated uh, containment you know, above the reactor. Is, where is that design in place elsewhere in the world? Well, um, we have a couple of dozen reactors in the United States that are basically um, not identical, but they're, they're as identical as they look. For these purposes, they're identical. Very similar. They're all designed by General Electric. And there is a comparable number of those around the world elsewhere. There, there are a dozen more, and maybe even 15 more uh, in Japan besides these six. <laughs> and then they're scattered around the world in several other countries. There are probably... Um, 50 or 60 or 70 of them. I'm not quite sure of the numbers elsewhere in the world besides the ones we have here. As best we can tell, this very large earthquake, as best we can tell, wasn't the cause of this accident. And certainly our reactors here uh, in California, Diablo Canyon and San Onofre would have survived that, uh, the, the motion they had there because they're designed for a larger motion than occurred there. If there hadn't had the tsunami, I'm convinced there wouldn't have been an accident. But, but you never know because, of course, the tsunami the events that overtook us right. were prevented us from knowing whether or not some subsequent failures might have caused the trouble. But four years ago, not quite, there was an earthquake across the across Honshu on the, on the um, west coast of, of Honshu um, uh, in Japan. There were seven reactors on that site, not very different from these, similar. And they all survived it uh, without a large accident. And in fact, none of the safety systems were damaged there, even though that was the motion there was about twice as big as they were designed for. So yes, I think we can do that, but boy, it's, it, takes, it takes diligent and careful engineering. Uh, the radiation does not come out in circles. And so <coughs> as time progresses, we now know there's a hot spot. It's about 30 kilometers northwest of the site. And so they will eventually probably get a kidney-shaped exclusion area to keep people out um, closer right. in. But the, uh, the levels in Tokyo are pretty low, and uh, I don't really think that just from normal lifestyle, people will get exposed to uh, you know, I think people fail to understand that radiation damage is not a one-time event. It's cumulative. It, it really depends upon your cumulative lifetime exposure. So like when the EPA sets a standard for drinking water, that's based on the assumption that you will drink at that level mm -hmm. for a lifetime and still not increase. So like when the water that, that you guys measure is above the EPA standard for a day, I mean, what you have to realize is that that's not how the standard was set. It was set on the assumption that, and it's the same way that if, you know, uh, it's like any environmental hazard, uh, if, if a lifetime at this level is dangerous, how dangerous is one day at this level? 
Right. Probably not very dangerous because it, it out, you have to average it out over a whole lifetime. Okay. The ocean is very large and very dispersive, and actually, the that's going to dilute these kind. One thing to remember: I mean, we're concerned mainly with cesium right now. That's what's going into the water. It's relatively water soluble. Uh, it does bioaccumulate, but it spreads out very fast into the ocean. And actually, I think the land deposition is a bigger problem because soil doesn't mix itself up and it doesn't dilute itself well. And actually, when you get cesium on the surface of the soil, it can get washed down and then stay there for much longer. So even though it's a very large amount of radioactivity, it's a very dispersive right. environment. Right. Probably a better environment to put that in than on the surface of soils or buildings or other things. Where it has to be. And would the same hold true for seafood as well? Is there any risk, um, you know, sea life ingesting this and having higher levels of concentrated uh, well, one thing is, we'll probably be able to measure it, so, so people will find it. Mm -hmm. But the levels at which we measure, you, you really have to look. I mean, that, again, because it's such a dispersive environment, I think the levels are going to go down fairly rapidly. Um, the fish equilibrate, so the fish don't grab onto the sea and hold it forever. Mm -hmm. They basically uh, reach chemical equilibrium with the ocean water levels. So if the ocean level goes down, the fish levels will, will follow. Okay. Yeah. Fall out in the form of, say, iodine going on the grass. Cows can eat the grass. They tend to send more of their iodine to the milk, and then babies can drink the milk, and that goes to their thyroid. So you can basically have a baby that's is consuming the equivalent of a good fraction of an acre of land in the milk they're drinking. So if you worry about those things in biology that can concentrate things when physics is doing a pretty good job of dispersing them. Um, surely the backfits to existing plants are going to be done if they're necessary, but it's easier to design a new plant with those features, a plant that hasn't been built yet, than to backfit an old one. It's, it's easy to understand that. It's easier to design a new car with a feature than to backfit an old car. Um, so all the new reactors presumably will learn those lessons too. And uh, how many reactors are in operation around the world today? In the U.S. we're I think the number is 104, but it might be plus or minus 1, 105. There are 420 or 430 around the world. We have about a quarter of them. And um, right now there are two or three dozen under construction, <laughs> mostly in the Far East, but not exclusively. Um, on top of the 420 or so, there's a, right. there's a very important thing people need to understand. Uh, these reactors are not perfectly safe. They never can be. There's no such thing as something that's perfectly safe. Those risks will always be there with these reactors, as they are with other high technology endeavors. The risks from this technology are apparently greater than we thought. This accident tells us that. That's for sure. Nobody anticipated this. Whether they're unacceptable is something the broader society's going to have to figure out. I'm not going to speculate on that. In fact, I'm not even sure we know yet. But that's for sure. And one of the sort of humbling things is that despite all the efforts to try to make these things safe, somehow these, and there were three of them, not just one, so it's three of them, and they were repeated. Uh, the same issue. Somehow these reactors got into trouble that nobody in the engineering community anticipated would happen in the way it did. So that's a humbling experience and we're going to all have to um, not only crow, but try to figure out what to do about it. So the industry will roll forward. Uh, uh, I think that the, a lot of the gleeful speculation about a nuclear renaissance and lifetime extension of these plants to age 70 and that sort of thing will probably abate for a while, but it's certainly not going to uh, uh, cause everyone to start an immediate moratorium on nuclear power tomorrow. We can't afford it. We'll have blackouts. There's just nothing else out there right now. There's some who proponents of thorium U-233 reactor designs. The fact is that like a lot of technology, something gets a head start and then it just becomes the technology of choice even if something else that might be better uh, uh, or, or we don't even know is better. It's come along. But there isn't any reason why those reactors wouldn't work. On the other hand, the sort of problems that they, we just saw would plague them too. You've got to design a reactor that can survive a blackout. You've got to design a reactor that can survive a You've got to design a reactor that can get flooded and continue to run. You've got to design a reactor that can 
that, that can be controlled properly and where measurements can be made to understand. <coughs> okay. Um, all sorts of can I add, yeah, yeah, sure. add something on that? Okay, um, uh, thorium, yes, does have exactly the same back end, the same fission product structure that, that uranium has. Uh, India is particularly interested in thorium because they, they have a lot of thorium and they have a lot of uranium. Uh, I saw a flow chart that showed something like 140,000 kilograms of uranium-233 moving around in the system and thorium breeding is what the goal was. The problem also with thorium, I mean, it, it's no worse than, than uranium, but it's no better. It's the, other, the other problem is it still has the same nuclear weapon diversion potential. In fact, uh, just to prove it, we blew off a nuclear explosive made with uranium-233 a long time ago. It had perfectly fine yield. It was out in Nevada somewhere. And uh, uh, so really there's no real advantage of thorium except that if you own uh, thorium, uh, it can serve as a fuel, nuclear fuel, at least as well as uranium. And, and while we're at it, let's talk about MOX because there's been some, some time in the press about how there was some MOX fuel in this reactor number three, which had to move this half as well. Now the MOX in there was, oh, MOX means mixed oxide fuel, a mixture of uranium and plutonium, right? So somehow that deadly plutonium is out there that's the most deadly thing on earth. It's about 10 times more toxic than uh, lead in your car battery, and it's about a millionth as toxic as some venom from some snakes in Brazil. So it's not the worst thing. But uh, MOX is controversial because it involves plutonium and all of that. But again, it has no increased threat in the back end of the cycle from these fission products and the decay heat and all the engineering problems of fission systems like this. And it does have the advantage that we're sitting on an incredibly large inventory of plutonium from our, our walk through the 20th century with nuclear weapon development. And this will help uh, burn down the supply of plutonium. So uh, the real risk with plutonium is not a few micrograms of it getting up in the atmosphere, but somebody showing up on your doorstep with five kilograms of it in the form of a nuclear explosive. So uh, we like MOX. We, we want to see reactors go forward with MOX technology it was not a contributor to this accident in any way. What can be done with the reactors at Fukushima? Well, the prediction, it's still too early to say, is that it's going to be just like what happened at Three Mile Island. Uh, Three Mile Island is from 1979, as, as everybody in this room uh, who's older than I am knows, and some of the younger ones may not. It was 1979. Uh, the core was destroyed in one of those reactors. And it was two or three years of sitting there while it, while it decayed <coughs> radioactively and also thermally until finally it was safe enough to, to, to be taken apart. And the whole thing was taken apart, decontaminated, a whole lot of radioactive um, stuff was removed from the metals, and um, it's still in storage. The core itself, the melted core, was taken apart and it was shipped to Idaho where it sits in a vault somewhere out um, west of Idaho Falls in a safe vault waiting for <coughs> to It was ultimately to be disposed of in the Yucca Mountain Repository in Nevada that's now that's, politically yeah, dead, as yeah. you know. Uh, and I'm sure that's what the Japanese are going to do. It's going to be a long <coughs> and expensive proposition. And part of it is because this is, um, the, the, uh, unlike a Three Mile Island, this is uh, uh, a much more, it looks looks to us like the mess is much more complicated than a Three Mile Island. Okay. So three Mile Island, this, every, is a, this is a 10, 15 year Everything at Three Mile Island stayed inside that vessel, <coughs> except for a little air Right. That is apparently not true here. There's a huge contamination in other buildings, in the not just inside the vessel, but inside the primary containment, inside the secondary, <coughs> in the reactor building, in the environs. There's much more contamination on the site than a three mile island, and that's going to be a really expensive and possibly dangerous mess to clean up. Okay. It's going to take a long time to. We didn't have very much information at first, not because they were hiding it, but because they didn't. Mm -hmm. I don't have any evidence that there's anything that they knew that they didn't tell not only us, but others were in the world. Well, it was hard to get, say, water chemistry data when. It was, uh, it was clear that the water could kill you in a few hours of exposure. They're not necessarily going to stand around there with fishing poles. Uh, one reporter said, well, then why didn't they discover this until yesterday? Well, that's when they turned on the lights, and they were able to go into buildings and look, and then they find things, well, uh, it was, that sort of thing. It was just so, too radioactive at first. Yeah, it was too radioactive at first, but then, uh, uh, for example, you may recall they, they found the two bodies from people that died drowned in the bottom of the turban building, and they didn't find those until last week. Why? Well, they couldn't go in there. Right. 
And so as they learn more about this, they go in more places. We're hoping it's sort of one of these separate spirals where more and more they do things. I haven't seen any effort that anyone in this industry is not 100% diligent. What's hard about the radiation statistics also is it's hard to part out well, uh, the other lifestyle things that go along with these uh, accidents and scenarios sure, like that. Uh, there's a, a lot of people are going to be under stress. There's been one suicide, which is directly related to this accident from yes. a farmer that lives in the area there. Well, that, that, that counts. Another, and another and uh, uh, on the other hand, just little things like people are less likely to eat fresh vegetables. They may not want to go jogging for their two miles every night because they're sure. afraid in the air, things like that. And those things, uh, when multiplied by several million people in society, do affect the uh, yeah, statistics, and it's hard to part those out. Or if they smoke cigarettes, <laughs> they might smoke more because they're stressed. And things like that are all going to be embedded in those statistics, and you may never get a straight answer for what's going on. And, and just to, I mean, this is not your thing. This is well documented in Chernobyl that the disease burden of the anxiety and the fear and the disruption was worse than the disease burden from the radiation. Because people would not eat. They got scurvy because they wouldn't eat fresh vegetables. Uh, they uh, got depression. Uh, so, you know, whether this is allocated to the nuclear accident or the kind of fear that's generated by it, the way people sort of build up this fear. Uh, it's actually in public health. This whole, the whole study of stress hormones and how they how they uh, impact the body is now a very important area. And they're actually as bad for your body as any environmental chemical we've ever seen. When we, under stress, we flood our body with chemicals that are more dangerous than things that come in from the outside. 